I understood that I had demand and I had a product and I could deliver that product to a community that really liked what I was doing. We had a local nightclub, it could hold 1,300 people and I set my eyes on that club. I was like, okay, cool, within a year, I want to do my first event there. 17 years old, my dad was a drug dealer. I used to walk, I used, no, I used to come home with like six, seven bags in, in cash. That's the fundamental goal for every single business is how do you make money by doing something once mm -hmm. and letting it make you money. Um, so how do you do that now? As a kid, you, ha you had confidence in everything he was doing or did you have to build that up through the stuff that he was doing in Southampton? Um, and then did it get knocked when you came to London? I built a demand for it and then I stopped taking bookings. I just cornered my market and just said, cool, you fucks with me, put up to my events, come and support me. It was at that point when I realised, okay, cool, I can now do this like for a living. This is the Promising Preneur podcast. I am Amelia Amarat and right now I am here with the biggest, the baddest DJ in London, DJ Seema. You got a body pop when someone introduces you like that. You got a little, little body pop for them. I'm done. He asked me to introduce him like that, so that's what we're gonna do. I absolutely did, but that's fine. It's what it is. Big up yourself. Steve, thank you so much for coming in no, today, my, my love. Pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I want to start with who is Simo? Not who's DJ Simo, but who is Simo? Uh, what away from the cameras and the Instagram and all of that? Exactly. I'm a nerd. Like, I'm actually the biggest nerd. You never, like, if you spend time with me and you know me properly, I'm like a goofy, silly... Can I swear on this podcast? 100%. Okay, yeah, I'm just, yeah, fucking goofy and silly. And <laughs> I love tech and anime and movies and all that kind of stuff. Like, I always tell people that Instagram is a facade. It's just the, por it's the portfolio. It's what you need to do to be polished for brands and all that kind of shit. But mm -hmm. people that spend time with me personally, like... Yeah, I'm a proper nerd. <laughs> I love that. So when you say that Instagram is a facade, it is for most people, but mm. no one would really admit to that, right? Yeah. So Instagram being a facade, what does that actually mean? Um, like social media um, and the desire of attention, let's call it, has just kind of grabbed everyone and... It's all about trading attention nowadays, isn't it? So actually, like, being yourself, there's only really, like, a handful of people that trust being themselves mm. away from their normal life online. Um, I'm not one of them. Like, I'm, I'm one of the guys where I've got specific social media platforms for different things. So, like, mm. if you follow me on Snapchat, you're going to see my day-to-day -day life. Like, that's literally where I can just be myself because brands don't really care about Snapchat. Right. Whereas, like, Instagram... Because it's a DJ profile, I'm going to show you guys the best parts of my DJ life. Right. Um, Twitter, you're going to get my thoughts. Uh, SoundCloud, you're going to get my sounds. So I've just really deliberately just divided all my social platforms so that I can have my own space to just be myself, basically. That's interesting, to be fair, because I think, I think that's a really good way of differentiating yourself. Um, and showing up where you need to show up. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Because I think a lot of people, a lot of people that want to build social media brands, they feel like they just need to be this fake person consistently across every single platform mm -hmm. and only show one one way of living. Right? Yeah, I mean, but that's kind of like how the whole thing has been engineered and how we're really, you know, all these Condition. algorithms and all this kind of stuff. Like, you, I meet a lot of, like, really popular people on Instagram all the time, have great conversations with them, get to know them and realise, like, you know, it's it, we're, we're kind of geared to, like, judge a book by its cover. That's mm. just how, like, human beings are. It's really something that we have to kind of unlearn. Mm. You might see someone that has, like, 200k followers and immediately feel intimidated and be like, okay, this person's better than me because they've got so many followers and whatever. You meet them in real life and they're just super cool and, you know, it's like, normal. it's just, just normal people. I'm quite fortunate to be surrounded by people across the entire following spectrum. You know, I've met mm. people with millions of followers and people that have next to no followers and treat them the same each time. Mm. Like, it's not really, for me, I'm not sucked into it. But in this day and age, like, yeah, it's, it's really a big kind of, I don't know, like a pulling factor, I guess, on how people treat each other. Which I think sucks. Content. Like I think that sucks ass. Like I think we should be we should be able to like <laughs> we should be able to just appreciate each other for what we're good at, mm. 
Yeah. Um, understand that, yo, my guy's got 100,000 followers because he's sick at graffiti or, you know, skateboarding or whatever it is that he does. Um, and my girl's got maybe a smaller following, but her cooking classes are sick. Mm. Like, tune in, take it in, you feel me? I think that's the creative in me, though. The creative in me will just appreciate stuff, whether it's got millions of followers or not. Like, yeah, I guess so that's something who, I love. <clears throat> who is the creative Simo? The creative Simo is, I'm really like a multifaceted creative. Like, I did a design degree, so my creativity started in design. Um, music was something that I fell in love with around the age of like 15, 16 years old. Um, <laughs> I fell deep into dancehall, like dancehall was my vibe, that was my whole thing. The first DJ sets were all bashment. And um, yeah, so like I've got... You're a bad boy DJ as well. Oh, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you, I appreciate you. I try, Holding down the vibes. Know, I appreciate you. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like my creativity, it spans from art to music to literally, I could just appreciate anything that requires some kind of artistry, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm a, just a very expressive person, like anything that I, you know, gravitate towards, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm just that kind of guy. Like, um, I think music has become the most, mm, I think that's my biggest expression at the moment mm. because sonically I just find ways to express myself. Like I just, yeah. whether that's performing or whether that's making my own remixes, my own music, being in the studio. Um, but behind all of that, most of the brands that I've created, most of the design work and artwork for my events, or most of the videos that I edited, I do that all in house. Like that's all, that's all me sitting behind a computer. That's basically my nine to five, just sitting in front of a computer creating what I want people to see if do that makes sense. you do that because you need to do that to put out your creativity so i.e your music and stuff like that or is it that you genuinely enjoy that side too I do enjoy it it does become laborious like there are times where I'm just like oh, I just wish I, could, I wish I could pay someone to do this and to be fair I have a whole social media team based in Texas who do social media for one of my companies okay. and having them has just kind of like woken me up to collabor collaborations mm. um i wasn't as collaborative before whereas now i'm like okay cool there's ways to outsource stuff and feel comfortable and confident i think it's a trust thing it's like if you're building your brand like i can imagine you must be so proud of your brand and you're not just gonna let anyone touch it so when you're like actually creating all of your content you know exactly what it wants to be like yeah. you feel me 100%. there was a point in time where people gravitated towards me when they found out that I was like, you know, the, the mastermind behind my brand and they would ask me to come and do stuff for their brands and it wouldn't always connect because I don't see your vision or you see, yeah, you'll see what I'm doing for me, realizing that for me it's instinctive. You know, I know exactly what I want everything to look like. There's a lot of people that don't know what they want their thing to look like, but they know what they don't, don't want it to look like. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know exactly what you're Do you know what I'm about. saying? For me, Originally, though, it started because I had the skills to do it through my design degree. It started as a way to save money. Like when I was a student trying to build my business, I didn't have all the money to pay a designer, a videographer, a photographer, blah, blah, blah. So I invested in a camera. I invested in Photoshop. And I just went at it. And I was just like, cool, this is the easiest way for me to kind of build my business on a budget. Mm. Um, and then when it got to a certain level and I started to make some decent money, I started to outsource and hire this guy for that, hire that guy for mm. this or whatever. But um, I think, especially for DJs nowadays, like in this day and age, you need to at least have like basic Photoshop skills. Like if you're releasing like your monthly calendar, like your gigs calendar, yeah. like you could pay someone on Fiverr or whatever to do it for you. But if you can whack it out yourself in five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, then it just saves a lot of time, a lot of like headache. So. 100%. And also a lot of money because... Yeah, mm. but there's, there's apps for that now. Like you've got Canva and all that kind of stuff. It all comes templated, so... 100%. So yeah. that brings me on to asking you about your businesses, mm -hmm. right? So you've got a number of a number of different businesses. Talk me through your events business. Cool. So that is kind of like my first business. Mm -hmm. um, ice cream. Ice cream parties, which has been running for. <laughs> I love that. So you see one of see one of Amanda wearing this band. 
Only certain people have this band, yeah. This band is for all the family that have really like stuck behind ice cream through the thick and thin. You're looking at me I mean, like, I mean, okay, fair enough. You know what I'm saying? Like, this... Stuck by ice cream through thick and thin. <laughs> it originally started. I'm a, new, I'm a newbie, so fine. Don't you worry, can... I got you, I got you. I got you. Give me origi- a it originally started because our events used to be so hectic on the doors, and it was like, how do we get all of our closest loved ones into the events without like stopping the door if that makes sense so yeah. it was just like if you had one of these you just go straight in like security would see it they'd realize that it's like it's our vi 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 vip band and you just walk straight in but now it's literally just limited to a handful of people that are very close to my heart okay. but yeah so ice cream first ever thing it literally was like an accident okay. <laughs> it was literally an accident and this is even like at the time when I wasn't even convinced I wanted to be a DJ. It, um, my first ever brand was called Chocolate. I don't know what it is about sweet dessert. <laughs> but yeah, okay. literally, I was just like, I love chocolate, by the way. It's mm-hmm. one of my things. Um, I was kind of in bit like, I wanted, oh gosh, how do I start this story? I wanted to be a basketball player, right? So a lot of people in London that know me from younger know me from the basketball community. Um, I put a video out the other day of me literally dancing around my flat to one of my remixes. Uh, and I was wearing my Luol Deng t-shirt mm-hmm. from one of the biggest basketball camps that was in Seven Oaks in Kent mm-hmm. when I was like a teenager. And when I finished A-levels, um, I deferred my entry to uni and I wanted to try and go to the States and play ball. But you know, 5'10", you know, five, ten, uh, you know I, had a, I had a jump shot on me, but... <laughs> Being 5'10 and not really having any like scholarship prospects, um, that dream kind of fell through. And I found myself on a year out before university, um, I actually gave up a scholarship to uni to try and pursue that dream. Okay. Um, and it was in that year out where I kind of discovered my love for music and DJing. Um, but prior to that, while I was in college, I used to throw these massive college parties and they were called chocolate. And they were basically like the gray area of like, you don't want to go to under 18 raves because you'd be around like 13, 14 year olds, mm-hmm. like proper kids. So it was for like that 17 to 19 year old gray area of we're not, some of us are old enough to go clubbing, but some of us still haven't turned 18 yet. So let's all party together. And we used to throw these massive parties. I'm talking like 2000 people. I was like one of the first, like literally one of the first kids in my borough to to do that with like big corporate venues like would trust me to bring like thousands of people to their doors um and that's how my at what age i was 17 mm. 17 years old my dad was a drug dealer i used to walk <laughs> I used, no i used to come home with like f- six seven bags in in cash just from like all the door money that mum would take mm. um me and my guy at the time um we created this really cheesy like name for a events brand it was called slam entertainment and oh, yeah. my real government name which i'm not going to tell you lot and then <laughs> sam so it was s and sam and um we basically ran sh- like college parties for like two years until we finished a levels and then we got to the end of that and we were like okay cool we're tired of like the college party thing let's go into unis and one of the local venues offered us a weekly residency to come and do a party and we're like what do you want to do and this Around this time is when my DJ career started, which again, a whole accident by itself, because <laughs> DJing for me was like, I loved music, but I never had the intent, like, I want to be a baller. So I never had the intention mm. of actually like going into being a DJ. Mm. It was something that I stumbled upon and realized that I was really good at it. Um, I tell the story all the time, shout out to my boy DJ Philly. He basically, he was a DJ in the ends at the time. I was living in Southampton. Um, and he basically tricked me like he he would, used to come and pull up to the yard and this is when man used to use like records like we used to have vinyls and go to the store every weekend and buy the new songs and whatever and it was actually my older brother that was a dj um but he didn't want me to touch his equipment so when he went of to course. uni and i'm on my year out and my my hoop dreams have died i'm like oh, i wonder what i'm gonna do with my time so mm-hmm. like i just basically stole my brother's equipment started bedroom mixing messing around so Philly comes over and he's just like, bro, like, you're actually really good. Like, you're good, good. Like, I go clubbing, bro, and you're good. Like, compared to these DJs, you're the shit, bro. Mm. I'm like, I'm going to be a baller, bro. What are you talking about? Like, I still mm-hmm. have my hoot dreams in the back of my head. So anyway, 
he realized I needed a push. And um, he lied to me. He said to me, bro, I want you to come play at my birthday. Yeah, it's going to be a garden party. It's in Winchester. Pull up, bring your records, and we're going to have some fun. So I pulled up, messing around, mixing, having fun, cutting, chopping, whatever. He comes up to me at the end and he goes, bro, I can't lie to you. This isn't my birthday party. This is the birthday party for the biggest promoter in Winchester. And he's here and that's his business partner. And they fucking love you. Like, they actually want you to come and be their resident every Thursday in Winchester. So I went from, like, never partying because I was always in the gym to getting paid to play music literally, like, almost overnight. And I felt, obviously, you love money. Like, when, you, when everyone loves money. So at first it was like, yo, I get to, I get, I get money paid? for this? <laughs> you get paid to play? And I don't have to, like, queue on, like, I can go to any nightclub. I'm, this is amazing. Like, what the fuck? Like, cool, let's do it. Um... And then gradually, as I got better, I fell deeper and deeper in love with the craft and the art of mixing. I'm, I'll never be one of those guys that is like super skilled with scratching and beat juggling and all this stuff. Like I leave that to like my role models, like Scotty B and you know, all those kind of guys that mm. are ridiculously good at it. I'm the smoothest mixer you ever hear. Like my transitions are the smoothest and that's, where I focused my energy. I was like, I want this mix to sound crazy. I want it to sound as if like I'm making live remixes in the club. Mm. And um, that was my, that was my focus. Um, so I, you found your niche. By, yeah. Like just stick into that. Yeah, literally. And um, I realized I had a really great taste in music. I was a multi-format DJ. They call, them, they call us open format DJs. So I never like locked in Although I started in dance hall, I never locked in to just dance hall. Like I could go to any rave and play amongst some of the best DJs in their genre mm. and be respected as a great DJ in that genre. But people wouldn't say, oh yeah, he's a Bashman DJ, he's an Afrobeat DJ or whatever. I could just express myself based on how I feel that day mm. or whatever music's in my mind at the time. And um, off the back of that, I isolated myself to my parties and that was deliberate. It was like, okay, cool. You want to come hear me play? Come pay for a ticket. Come pay for a ticket at one of my parties and you can hear me play at one of my parties. That's and interesting. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of cornered the market. I built a demand for it and then I stopped taking bookings. I just cornered my market and just said, cool, you fucks with me, put up to my events, come and support me. Um, but the way Ice Cream started, when they gave us this, this opportunity to do a weekly event in Southampton, we couldn't think of a name. And we went off the back of this whole chocolate thing and we was like, hmm, what's sweet like chocolate? And it's like, oh, we can we want to call it ice cream. Like ice cream's a nice name. And next door to the club was a Ben and Jerry's. Like Ben and Jerry's, um, they are they're owned by well, not owned, but like they are licensed to Odeons. So you always see Ben and Jerry's at Odeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went next door to Odeon, because this was like one of those leisure centre complexes, right? There's like arcades and shit, bowling alleys mm. or whatever. And then there's a nightclub outside. So we went to Ben and & Jerry's and it was like, yo, we're launching a new student night. Would you guys sponsor us? And basically Ben & Jerry's like gave us all of their products at cost price. So we would buy these industrial sized tubs of Ben & Jerry's, serve over a hundred people per tub at cost price. And they give us like all the merchandise and all the like cups and the spoons and everything. And we would serve the whole club. Like people would come to the parties have fun, listen to music they love and be eating like cookie dough in the corner of the club. Just like, what the hell? Like, this is fucking amazing. You get fucking Ben and Jerry's for free. I mean, Yo, that it is was, life. It was a vibe. So we built our name just by being this quirky, weird and cool student night that represented authentic hip hop in Southampton. So, yeah, like a whole year during my gap year, we just throwing parties, working with different clubs. And um, that's kind of how it all started. So what happened? What happened for you in that transition period when you was going from getting people to book you to you then saying, do you know, what? actually, no, I'm going to stop taking bookings now and I'm going to do this for myself. Like, how was that transition? Was that smooth? Did you, was there moments of like just... No one's gonna come to. No one's gonna come, and like um, money issues. Like, there's pros and cons to it. Right. Like, I kind of cornerboard myself in the industry, and only literally recently I was speaking to a DJ on on Instagram, and I realised that there was this like 
there probably still is like this whole community of DJs in London that thought that I thought I was the shit. Like I was too good for everyone. I wasn't booking people for my parties. And that, that wasn't the case at all. Like I'm a big fan of most of the DJs I hear play. Like I'm a big fan of what they do. It's just, I wasn't from London. So this, this all really happened when I moved to London. And I, um, I went to Brunel University and I was stuck in the corner of London and I identified a massive opportunity for me to build, rebuild, should I say, ice cream when I moved from Southampton to London in Uxbridge, which is where I was basically operating for like the last 11 years, right? Mm. Um, so, but then it was kind of like, I had such a, a big popularity on that campus because I went from kind of dropping my business in Southampton, moving to start university, not being able to commute. And well, to be fair, I commuted for the first six months back to Southampton running events. Mm. And it was just too much. Yeah, yeah. And trying to like keep a monopoly on the market and stuff, it was just a lot. So I let it go. And then I found myself starting from scratch. And I had loads of doors open, f open for me by a couple of local DJs who had heard my name buzzing on campus. And I'd got that buzz because I just started playing house parties. I literally played like 30 house parties in my first year. It got to a point where I got banned from campus. Like I literally wasn't allowed to live on campus. Um, <laughs> and I had to like sign like a, like a form saying that I'm not going to live on campus and I had to pay a fine to the university for all the noise complaints that I created, mm -hmm. even if they weren't in my halls. Like it got to a point where security would see me on the strip, like walking down the strip from lectures Target. and be like, where are you playing tonight? I'm like, y'all going to have to catch me. <laughs> y'all going to have to catch me. Target. So it was, um, it started off really organically and this is around like the funky house era mm. and people just wanted to come and hear me play. The students were just like, I had a lot of like support on campus. Um, so yeah, so when I then decided, cool, now's the time, let me launch. Let me relaunch Ice Cream. Like I've got the blueprint in my mind. I know what I want to do. I know how to run the doors. I know how to do this, whatever. But I want to, this is when I decided I now want to stop the whole house party thing, stop taking bookings to like, they, we used to do coach parties when we was in uni. We had like these massive coach parties. They were so inspiring. We had like, oh, what was the one in Leicester? It was called Roblox. Roblox run mm -hmm. by Pick and Mix. And they were like the guys at the time. And mm -hmm. two of them went to my uni. So I was really trying to emulate what they was doing, but locally, like I didn't want to make everyone get on coaches and travel. Yeah. We had a local nightclub. It could hold 1,300 people. And I set my eyes on that club. I was like, okay, cool. Within a year, I want to do my first event there. And there was no students doing events at that club at the time. So I literally did my first event in, where was it? Bar Inc in Norfolk, 150 capacity. It's like a little bar almost like a pub and I was like cool we're gonna sell this one out and then we're gonna move on we're gonna do the next one sold it out wall to wall roof sweating one of them ones you know them yeah. crani yeah. raves there <laughs> yeah literally so <laughs> whoa it did describe your own party yeah no crani. but they're, they're the best ones and I'm not gonna lie like you just go there and you just sweat it out like they're, yeah. they're actually like the best raves when you're a student anyway so then we then moved on to another venue it was double the size sold it out twice and then off the back of that we had enough buzz on campus and we was like cool um a local promoter approached me and said i can get you the super club and i was like boom let's do it like let's go for it so i launched a party the first party i done it was called simo's beach party this is a beach theme party like you'd come like hula necklaces and girls will come out in the skin out shorts <laughs> and the man then would come in vests and string vests and all that <laughs> And there's a giant foam cannon. This foam cannon was ridiculous. Like people were drowning in the foam. Like it was actually a mad thing, literally. And that was my first party. Like my first big scale production in Uxbridge. And um, it was at that point when I realized, okay, cool. I can now do this like for a living mm -hmm. because I understood that I had demand and I had a product and I could deliver that product to a community that really liked what I was doing. Where did where did this business acumen, because you talk about product and demand and no, understanding understanding your business, mm. where did that come from? I always had that, like literally, like I was the kind of kid that would sell, sell shit like on the school playground or try and hustle shit on the school play, playground, like whether it was like yo-yos or pogs or digimons or whatever they, whatever the trend was at the time, I was always the kid that was trying to like find a way to make money. 
um, go house to house washing cars, like all that kind of shit. Um, I remember my first job, I literally, well, how old was I, like 13? And I was a kitchen porter in the back of a restaurant. I had, all I wanted to do was buy the sickest mountain bike. I was just like, cool. So I need to get my money up. So I've always had that mentality of, if you want something, you got to go for it. But then learning business and understanding supply and demand and just the basics of business, that really changed when I got into the events industry mm. and understanding how you can leverage your time and make residual income. That's like, that is the goal. That's the fundamental goal for every single business is how do you make money by doing something once mm -hmm. and letting it make you money. Um, so how do you do that now? I have multiple events businesses, like okay. loads of them. Um, there's so many, like there's so many events companies that I have, people don't even know that I have them. And I, I love that. I love the fact that it's under the radar. Um, because like I said, a lot of the industry kind of didn't take to me because I wasn't reliant on the network, you know, like back then everyone would work together. Mm. Um, but because I was in the corner of London that really was self-sufficient, like I didn't need anyone and I had design skills. I didn't even need to hire anyone to help me put it together. I had the relationship with the venues and I was a lit DJ. I didn't even need to book anyone. Mm. I, yeah, like it was difficult for me to network into the scene. So mm. for a long time, I was just, I, the people that respected me, they were doing it as well. You know, there was other people that were doing similar to me, like big up Uncle Tio in Leicester. He's still got it popping up there all now. Like I think he's been there for like 15 years, Turbs and all them, man. There was Chris Essence who was doing Hertfordshire at the forum. Um, so all these like fringe mm. venues, um, Munya, who's killing it down at Casino in Gloucester. Like, all of us fringe venues, like, we just didn't need anyone because it's such an isolated community and it's mm. off ends. So, like, no one's traveling there to try and take your business. It didn't really make sense. Mm. So, I held a monopoly in my area and I just built it. Um, gift and a curse because you get stuck in that community and it got to a point where there was, I couldn't do any more with it. Like, yeah. You know, our last event before lockdown, we did it with Pop Smoke in Watford and 1,500 people came out and it was like, where do we go from here? Like, this mm. is... Obviously, then the pandemic happened after that, but at that point, after we'd done that show, it was like, yo, we've just done an event with Megan Thee Stallion. We did two events with Tory Lanez on the same night, 3,000 people across two different venues. How do we keep pushing the level? Mm. How do we? How do we elevate and I realized that I needed to come into London, like I needed to start embracing the London scene to get them to embrace me back. Mm. Um, I was quite fortunate that at the year before that, most that discovered me and then took me on the road. And then that's where people started to like hear Simo outside of Uxbridge, right. which was a blessing. So, um, so you became, yeah. you became most that's DJ. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Mo from nowhere. Like a lot of people think like, we grew up together or, you know what I'm saying? Like one of those stories where someone's bus that they brought their brethren with them. Yeah. Never met Mo. Didn't so know how, him from how nowhere. did that happen? Um, so Mo came and played one of the ice cream parties in Uxbridge. Okay. It, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was like a Halloween party. I think it was in 2016 or 2017. And he heard me play for the first time. Now anyone that knows Mo, he either loves something or he hates it. Like <laughs> it's very rare that it's in between. And when he... When he loves something, like he bangs on about it. So Shane calls me, Shane's Mo's manager. He calls me the day after. And he was like, bro, Mo couldn't stop talking about you, champ. Like, he's loved your DJ set, bro. Like, it's amazing, fam. Wow. The impressions, impressions wow, the you impression. Know, yeah. Wow. <laughs> he was like, um, how do you feel about being Mo's DJ? I was just like, yo, that's sick. Like, who, like, who'd say no to that? I remember we did like a trial event. I think um, Retro 82 had a concert in Kentish Town, O2, end of that week. And he wanted to bring out Mo as like an opening act. So Shane was like, yeah, come true. Let's um, see what the vibe is like, see if Mo kind of takes you. And um, yeah, it was all good, man. We shut down the show and then I've been on the road with him ever since. So that was a really nice moment in my career because it kind of, two things happened. Number one, it opened up my world yeah. to a whole different audience, a whole different market. But number two, it gave me self-confidence. It was like, yo, like, People 
starting to really like get me yeah. recognize what man's on like I'm lit like and my confidence wasn't there at the time because so, yeah just because again the London kind of industry or rave community or in the uni rave community they hadn't opened up to me like people weren't booking me like that and at the same time I had isolated myself from a lot of the local promoters in Uxbridge on purpose obviously because I, I didn't want to be at every event mm -hmm. because then why would people come to my event you feel me yeah. I was the USP at ice yeah. cream so talk to me <clears> about <throat> this confidence right like if you're enjoying this podcast so far this is only going to annoy you for a hate on click subscribe click follow and drop a quick comment and if you've done all of those already then send me a five-star review because honestly it's the only way we survive on the internet thank you where do you where do you think obviously i strongly believe in confidence is formed from evidence right, right. so if you are if you're doing something and people gravitate towards it, that's evidence that you're doing something good, which builds up a confidence, right? right? right. If you um, do something and you realise you can do it yourself, that mm -hmm. builds up your confidence because mm -hmm. it's evidence that you can do it, right? Mm -hmm. So from every, everything that you're saying, you started doing the uni parties and stuff um, back in Southampton and because people were gravitating towards you, that was your evidence and that built up your confidence, right? Before yeah. any of that, had you suffered and I say, I say suffered lightly, but had you felt like as a young, as a kid, you, ha you had confidence in everything he was doing, or did you have to build that up through the stuff that he was doing in Southampton? Um, and then did it get knocked when you came to London? To, to answer that question without taking it too long-winded, I had a really unsettled childhood, incredibly unsettled. So I wasn't a very confident kid. Mm. Um, there's so much I've learned about myself I'm still learning about myself and I lived in so many different places around the UK um, I came here fresh from Sudan literally find a better life all that a lot of the similar stories of African kids first generations that live in this country and I literally lived in Blackpool Cardiff Bristol Southampton London went to college in Winchester and lived in Bristol twice, so left Bristol, came back to Bristol. Um, didn't have ends, didn't have a community, didn't have a road that I could say, yeah, man, grew up on this road. Like every three years I was somewhere else, you know? Didn't have like a foundation of people that if something went wrong in my life, I'd call my brethren and be like, you get me? I didn't even have people that back the beef. Like if something happened to me, that was me and my brothers. Me and my brothers had to handle that. So, um, I didn't have confidence because socially I was a mess. Like I was, I didn't even have, like I had a whole identity crisis growing up because I didn't even look African. My brothers look African, I don't even look African. So growing up in the UK, <laughs> in the 90s and the noughties, where racism was still very overt, it was like, it was crushing for a kid that didn't really have identity, you know? So as I came into my adult life, really trying to understand myself, Finding artistic expressions and expression through sport freed me. Like it made me, that's what gave me confidence. Like realizing without other people telling me that I'm good at something because I liked what it sounded like or my crossover was better than the next man's crossover or my jump shot was better. That was stuff that contained me and made me feel happy. Like it made, it gave me validation. Like I'd wake up every day trying to improve that slightly. I was obsessed with basketball. Like obsessed I was first kid in the gym every single day seven o'clock in the morning I would wake up and my college was like 45 minutes away mm -hmm. so for me to get there at 7 a.m. I still got to wake up and shower and all that kind of stuff I'm getting up at 5 a.m. to be at college by 7 a.m. all the kids thought I was nuts I would go 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. practice my dribbling practice my shooting go to class at 8 30 after showering and that lunchtime come back to the gym they'd open the sports hall for me and i'd be shooting i'd be shooting i'd be shooting like i was it was my world literally and music combined into that because when i had my headphones on it was the soundtrack to my life you feel me like whatever i was listening to at the time was a part of that whole experience you feel me mm. so building that confidence it came from me just feeling comfortable and prepared for any situation. Um, 
this is when I used to practice DJing. Like I stopped mm. at a point. It just became freestyle after that. But um, yeah, once I got to a point where I was like very confident in my skills, I'd walk a bit differently, you know, like I'd, I'd have my head was a bit higher and I felt prepared in any room. Like I, I could jump on any set with any DJ and feel empowered knowing what I'm about to do. Like, yeah, your set was your set was dope, bro. Like but I'm about to fucking destroy this room. You have no idea what I'm about to do. Mm. And yeah, like, you know, that confidence kind of built built over time mm. when I started to hear other people play and whatever. And I started to realize like, I, I have an edge over a lot of DJs. I don't see, I don't mean it in like an arrogant way. It's just the confidence I have in myself. Like if I step in a room and I'm, and I'm lit and I'm on it that day and my, you know, like, the crowd is ready for it like I'm taking you to a different place mm. and when I, I that I realized that over time like it took time for me to realize that but um do you think sorry to cut you do no, you okay. do you think that you wanted to put on parties and put on events to make people feel you mm. based on the lack of confidence you had as a child was that validation to see um, 150, 300, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000? To see that, mm, is there an so. element of... No, no, no. So, like, I don't, I don't think so. I think that it was the perfect storm for me. It was kind of like the love for the craft, the love for the business, um, the unity of those two things, and then also the actual, like, mission behind it. Before I became a DJ, again, like being someone who's grown up around the UK and has been faced with a lot of racism, it was like, I didn't really understand it. I didn't really get it. I didn't understand why people didn't like us for being different. You know, whether whatever shade of skin tone you were, you always felt othered. And I hated that. And and I and that was something that every five minutes you're just reminded that if you are not from this normal social construct, you're an other. Mm -hmm. Whatever that might be. Even mm -hmm. being a basketball player, like basketball is such a it's such a beautiful sport, but there's so many sides to it. And there was a side that I grew up in which was street ball. And we used to play on the streets with the with the mandem. And we would get cussed in training. Like, you do anything fancy or crazy or whatever where you express yourself a bit. Um, the coaches, who were predominantly of a certain colour, would really get on the and be like, cut all that shit out. Like, they didn't really like the pizzazz. And I, I was a very expressive person. So when I realised that this was also applied in music and how they marginalised our music very early, I'm talking, like, right at the beginning of Grime, you know, like security guards would come up to me in the, in the club and tell me to like switch songs or stop playing a certain type of music or can you play something a bit more commercial or whatever. I started to get frustrated. So it was like the reason why I grew as a DJ is because I wasn't afraid to play what I loved mm. to listen to. And instinctively, again, for us, that's what, what the mandem listened to, isn't it? Like what we used to listen to, you know, early Wiley, like like Mofa crew, like Kano, like that's the kind of shit we grew up on, you know? So when we're starting to play like Grime and Funky House and Bashment and all that kind of stuff in the raves, people started to come to the raves because it was something that you couldn't get in a normal club room. Mm -hmm. um, so as my journey is happening, I'm starting to realize the mission behind my journey. Okay. And that is to actually represent our culture Afro-Caribbean culture in an unapologetic, authentic way in the biggest clubs in the UK, in the clubs where they won't, they normally wouldn't let us in. Mm. And I say this all the time when I talk about it, I recognise myself as a Trojan horse, again, because man don't look African. Like, I'm walking in these rooms and these, like, big club managers mm. are looking at man like I could be Hispanic or whatever. So when I'm saying, yeah, I'm going to bring you a thousand people, they're probably thinking I'm going to bring like a thousand Arabs or Spanish people or whatever to their doors and we're going to have a, like what they would consider the perfect party for them. You mm. feel me? Boy, <laughs> thousands of them and them turn up to the rave and we turn it over the same way. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then they find themselves in a situation because they can't then tell me not to come back because we're shutting down the part. The party's lit. They're making money. A lot of these clubs, their main rooms were struggling. They weren't really making money mm. because they weren't embracing the hottest styles of music at the time. Mm. So now that we're in the door, like we kept that door wide open and we, we, we rinsed these venues. Like We was going crazy for literally like 12 years. But came with a lot of pressure came with a lot of stress like they tried that we had so many events that were cancelled so many events that were pulled we had issues with police we had so much problems just trying to maintain and celebrate our our music and our culture without you know feeling like it wasn't accepted if that makes sense yeah marginalized so then that, again this is where the mission really came in i started to understand that yo this these aren't just parties you know this is not just you feel me? Like, man, just not just out here to play music. Like, we're out here to pave the way for whether that's the next generation or the generation after that to take music of black origin and really get it to that level. And, like, honestly, seeing things like Afro Nation and, like, you know, even brands like DLT and Recess and all these kind of things, like, doing it on that level now like that's amazing to me you feel me like even guys like dj nate doing these massive dancehall concerts like up and down the country it's like what the hell like back in the day these were not easy things to do yeah they weren't really like accessible all the time you know so seeing it happen now that's kind of what we was trying to do from early mm. um so, so, so how do you feel now that you see you see the way paved now right like mm. that's what you was do that's what you've always been doing and now you see huge companies come up doing exactly that mm -hmm. how does that make you feel and where do you fit in to the industry then um it makes me feel proud like it makes me feel like really proud of the whole industry that we've got it to that level and there was like for me there was a big focus on branding um polishing up your brand to make it more kind of acceptable by the mainstream and obviously it was quite easy for me because i had this really like fluffy name like ice cream um to kind of do that just making sure the graphics and the videos and everything was just proper so now to see other brands doing that as well i think it's a blessing i think it, it really benefits just the whole scene in general um where I fit in, I've never really tried to fit in. I've always tried to just do what I authentically love mm. at, the, at that moment in time. COVID changed the industry massively um, mm. because everything shut down, literally. Like our main venue in Uxbridge that we built our business on is gone. Like it didn't survive. So it is completely gone. Like we have an event tonight in Uxbridge. We're working with our older venues, but they're smaller. Mm. So getting that like that indoor festival vibe in those pockets of London just it doesn't exist anymore. However, these um, newer brands are definitely doing amazing jobs, like working with venues like Box Park Wembley, Box Park Croydon. They're doing these great and day parties have become a thing now. Like back then, yes. day parties weren't a thing. Oh, I love a day party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trust me, much me, better than me a night in your one. bed by midnight. Get you what? I wake up next morning fresh the same way. I'm telling you. Yes. So the game has changed. But um, for me, coming out of the pandemic, I've just kind of let God present me with where he wants me to be. Um, I've always had the talent to build a business. Um, but I was forced into London because of the pandemic. Again, because our venues closed down. So it was like, okay, cool can't do business there anymore or that you can but it's not sustainable it's not like big enough for you to like pay rent so how can you now reinvent yourself but mm. i'm that guy like i've reinvented myself a hundred times from moving house as a, as a child from having to move from southampton to london and restart my business it's like a challenge that i'm so used to that i just took it in my stride and um I've managed to build so many different versions of like events companies now. One's like an old school events comp company. One is an Afrobeats events company. I've got an, a throwback events company. Like 
there's so many different pockets. I've got an overseas events company that does like holiday parties and stuff like that. And I get to work with really cool people. Um, and it's opened me up because I play at all these events. So mm. now working with all these different promoters and partnership, they've all taken me in as a DJ as well. And they're like, yo, you're actually a sick DJ. And I'm like, well, I've been a sick DJ. It's just, <laughs> y'all just never heard me. <laughs> like, I remember um, I got approached by a really cool venue in Camden. And I knew of the the guy that owns this venue, like he, he didn't know at the time, but he's like one of my role models. Like I used to watch his brand and he was like one of the biggest promoters in London. Like this guy would do like 15 Halloween parties in one night. And I used to be like, how, how do you even do that? So when we started working together, it was a blessing, but even he didn't know I was a DJ. So I remember when we done the first event with him at his venue, he, yeah, he's coming downstairs into the venue and he's just like, where's your DJ? I'm like, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm here. And he's like, oh, you're the DJ. I'm like, bro, DJing is what started all of this for me. Mm. Like, obviously, London hasn't woken up to me yet because I've been on the edge. I've just been sitting in Uxbridge for like the last decade. Mm-hmm. But now is my chance and now is my time. And I'm about to show you, look, like I'm lit. And it took about six, seven months. I had to play quite a few like free gigs, even at my level. I played a couple of free gigs. I, I, would, I would go to promoters who had sick parties. I'm like, bro, your next party, I'm coming to play. I'm going to play for free. And if you like what I do, book me for your next party. If you don't, cool. I'm still going to come support. It is what it is. And um, now I don't have a free weekend. Like I literally am booked pretty much every Friday, every Saturday, most Sundays. Sometimes, like last week, I was... Wednesday, Thursday, twice on Friday, twice on Saturday, once on Sunday. So it's getting crazy now. And this year, since February, I've done Amsterdam, Prague, Malta, Mallorca, Munich, Ibiza, Dubai. Yes. And that's in the last six months. This time last year, I had like maybe three bookings a month when I was just trying to build. So it's crazy. It's like God has pushed me in the direction that he feels I should be going in. And I I have the talent, I've got the skill. It just took a divine intervention to push me to that next level. Because remember, like after I'd done that Pop Smoke show, I was just like, I can't take the student thing any higher now. Like This is it. This is as high as it goes. Like, mm-hmm. if I want to progress my career and take myself to that next level, I need something. That's why I felt like the, the COVID for me was rough. Like it was hard. It was really tough for DJs. Like, but at the same time, I feel like that was a big sign from God. What in that? So say last year, right? You said that you've you was having three bookings a month in mm-hmm. comparison to right now. You're looking at three a night sometimes, right? In the moments when it was the hardest, mm-hmm. what was going through your head? I went to quit, man. It's crazy. Like, I went to give up because I'm, I'm a very emotional person. I'm a Scorpio. I don't know you Scorpios, whatever. Get out of there. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm a Scorpio. I'm a very passionate person, which is what why art resonates with me. I'm quite emotionally tuned in. Like, people tell me I'm quite emotionally intelligent. And um, it was hard for me to fight my feelings about the pandemic. I felt like music had betrayed me. The music industry mm-hmm. had betrayed me because I put my whole heart into it. Not even just from the perspective of making money, but also to like change the game. Right before the pandemic, I was working with licensing units to make it easier for urban promoters to throw parties. So, because we was getting our parties shut down all the time and they pulled, they, they had this form called the 696, it's God forsaken form, which basically would allow local licensing units to gather risk information about your party and if they deemed it to be too high risk they could literally pull the plug on your event and all my promoters watching this you know because if you're in my field you've definitely had an event pulled i've had so many events pulled and um we were like enough is enough we went to a forum the met police was there licensing units were there and we said look like there must be a better way of doing this there must be a way that we can mitigate risk Mm -hmm. and actually like put measures in to let an event that you deem high risk to happen. And we've done that. Like, we've done a few shows with, um, I'm not gonna name the artist, but we've done a couple of shows with some artists that were deemed as like high risk artists. 
where the police had contacted us and said, oh, we're going to pull the event. Mm. Um, and they trusted us and we put in some mitigating like um, measures to make the event safer mm. in their eyes and executed a really safe, successful event. Everyone went home happy, everyone went home safely. So we were working with licensing units right before the pandemic happened to try and make that easier across the board within the M25 for all promoters. Um, there was a whole board set up for it, it was called the Safer Sounds Network. And they made me the chair of that board. So it was, not, it was very hush-hush at the time. Um, then the pandemic came in and the funding for that went and they just kind of like started focusing on like training for venues and anti-terrorism and all that kind of stuff. So it kind of went by the wayside, which was really frustrating for me and the people that were involved. Mm. But I was dealing with my own shit. I was dealing with the fuck, like, I put my heart and soul into this and it's just disappeared, like, almost overnight. Um, and I had got so sucked into the business side of it, I was DJing on autopilot, you know, like, right after, or I'd say around the same time that Mo discovered me, I was always the headline DJ for all of my events and we was doing... Mm, two to three parties a month with a thousand plus people um so i was really comfortable you know like i wasn't pushing like i knew i'll turn to my parties and i'll shut it down and i'll go home mm. and if you came to my parties you'd know about me but anything outside of that nobody knew about me there wasn't tiktok like right. instagram reels and all this kind of shit it was just kind of like you come and see me live you're gonna know what it is but online, I had no presence whatsoever. So you can imagine when the clubs closed, I became no one. Like overnight, I literally went from like the littest DJ in my ends to nobody knows about me. And that was crushing. It was just like, fuck, like, what do I do? Like, where do I go? Like, I'm a, and having African parents, they're on, man. They're like, bro, like, you're getting older mm -hmm. and your business is just like completely shut down. What are you gonna do with your life? And I wanted to quit, literally wanted to quit. I was like, I've got a degree, I'm a straight A student. I could do anything academic if I wanted to. Mm. Um, so yeah, getting back into it was a slow process for me. I know a lot of people that hit the ground running mm. and you know, just bounce straight back into it. For me, there was just a period of time where I just had no energy, Yeah. you know? Like I literally just woke up every day just feeling flat. Mm. Like there's just nothing there. There was no gas in the engine. Um, and then when I found out that the venue in my ends closed down, that was another hit. Mm. So during the pandemic, do you know what I did? I played basketball every day, every single day. I became like a local legend in my area mm. we used to go to this court in Cowley um and we built this like community of ballers that would go there every day during the summer that covid summer mm. man was just hooping every single day I didn't think about music I didn't think about anything I didn't even I wasn't concerned about anything I just wanted to play basketball every single day Man, I started off really bad because I don't play basketball in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but two months down the line, it was lit. It was one of the best ballers on that court. And that just allowed me to get rid of my stress. It allowed me to just, you know, just get it out of my system. So when, um, oh, I, I opened a kitchen as well. Very random. But this is because, again, this is because I know how to of launch, course. I know how to launch businesses. Yeah. So when business ideas come to me, if they speak to me and they resonate with me and I, f I see the angle, I'll invest in it. Like, it's just how I've always been, you know. I've had multiple businesses over the years. I had a CD printing company before CDs became irrelevant. <laughs> we used to do CDs for everyone. Like, literally, like, if you had a mixtape, do you remember back in the day, like, outside the rave, you'd have, like... People could... <laughs> yo, 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 take my CD, take my CD, you yeah, bump yeah. it in the car we was printing most of those CDs. You was that guy. <laughs> yeah, we had this giant CD printer, CD stacks, we'd duplicate people's CDs. Um, so when this kitchen idea come around, um, I invested in a kitchen brand that was already existing. 
and there was a new venue that was opening and this is like rule of six times you know like if you go to brunches you have to sit at the table you're not allowed to stand up yeah. and dance or whatever yeah and we got plugged into a venue in um ilford to run their kitchen and at this time again londoners didn't london most londoners my age didn't really know about me mm. so my first introduction to london was actually running a kitchen like a lot of people just saw me as this guy that was just running this kitchen in this really popular venue. And I'd be there having conversations with staff members that work in the venue. And I'd be like, you know, I'm a DJ, right? <laughs> like, I, could, I can spin tunes. They're like, yeah, 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 cool story, bro. So like, how those burgers coming along? I was just like, wow. But, um, but it's the hustle. That, that hustle mentality has always obviously been in you for you to be able to just continuously reinvent. And I think that's a, that's a massive quality. Like, mm. one of the biggest qualities I see in you is something I see in myself. Like, the continuous... I also went back and forth in life, as in growing up was ridiculously unstable. Like, yeah. I was called the bag lady. Oh, really? Legitimately. Like, I would <laughs> sleep anywhere that would take me. Oh, wow. Park bench, car, friend's house, cousin's house, grandparent's house, anywhere's <laughs> house. Um, but my own, right? Yeah, so yeah. I, under I, I understand what you're saying about this, the instability and what that does to you. Mm -hmm. But I think that adversity makes us deal with any kind of adversity yeah, because yeah, yeah. we've had to. Mm -hmm. And that quality only comes over time. And I just feel like what during the pandemic, regardless of the fact that shit went shit went nuts and downhill for a lot of people you being able to come out and get to 2022 and have five six bookings in one weekend oh man, i'm so i feel so blessed right now for all like i commend you i commend crazy. you for for not not giving up yeah, yeah, yeah do you know what i'm saying because if you did what would have happened exactly which is the lesson which is the lesson in this all is like that moment that you felt like giving up if you really took it, today wouldn't be today. It's so true. And the reality is you only fail if you quit. And that's, that's like one of the biggest things I say to a lot of my, young, my youngers that like, I used to have street teams that worked for me. At one point I had over 120 members of my street team, like literally students that love my events so much. They bring all their friends to the parties. And when we used to like distribute tickets, we used to sit in one of the coffee shops in Uxbridge and I used to just rap with them. I used to, they used to ask me for advice. I used to talk to them. They all had different problems. This one had man problems. This one had uni problems, whatever. This one was feeling depressed. And I would sit there for hours and just talk to them hmm. and give them advice. And one of the main things I tell them is, look, whatever you want to do, yeah, you have to just believe in it. And you need to just never quit. You'll get there. Eventually, you're either going to exhaust all the ways of not to do it <laughs> and find the one that will work. Yeah. You know, like it's going to happen. You just have to be dedicated and just have to push. Um, but it was a very foreign feeling for me to wake up in the pandemic and just not have drive. Yeah. I've been driven my whole life. Mm -hmm. My whole life I've been driven. So to wake up one day and just be like, I can't be fucked. That was a very weird feeling for me. And I know a lot of DJs went through it. Like I, I, it's, I don't know. I've, I don't think I've seen any podcast where DJs really talk about what the lockdown was like. Mm. You know, I've got friends that are teachers that are just like, lockdown was like a holiday. Like, we still got mm. paid. Yeah. You know, we, we were still teaching. Like, life didn't stop for us. We were still doing what we was doing. Yo, that shit stopped for us. Dead. It stopped dead. And for someone like me who was so heavily invested in my business, um, you know, I had just opened an office. I had employees, like... I was so heavily invested. It was tough, man. Like, it was really, really rough. But um, off the back of it, yeah, like I said, it's just that when that drive kicked back in, it came back with a vengeance, boy. Like, <laughs> it came back with a vengeance, literally. And, yeah, it I does. mean... 
one it of, normally does. Yeah, that's just kind of how it works, that's isn't it? it? Like works. sometimes you just kind of switch off for a second, and then when it comes back, it's just like yo. But that second drags. Yeah. It feels like it drags for so long. It really, long. really does. It really does. But this is why I just distracted myself, and basketball really helped me with that. Mm. Basketball's a beautiful sport, man. It's just full of discipline and focus, and it's really helped me guide my life. Like some of the shit that we had to do at basketball camps, the punishments. Like if you was undisciplined, if you were late. Or if you, you know, spoke back to your coach. Mm. You know, people say, people like watch Coach Carter and be like, is that what it's like? Yes, motherfucker, that's what it's like. <laughs> like, if you played for a, a high-level basketball team, mm. they weren't your coach, that was your dad. Mm. That was your father. That guy there or that woman there that was teaching you, they literally taught you life lessons on that court. I think sport does that, which is a really, really good thing. And I think a lot of creatives have a tendency to associate themselves with sport. Mm. And those that don't associate themselves with any kind of sport end up having a much harder time of mental health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, give me three things that you have learnt throughout life, throughout business, that you would want to tell the next DJ, tell the next events, events um, business owner, the next creative, three things. Believe in your source. Like, that's the over overpowering message. Like, there's only one version of you. You are the most unique investment that you could ever make. There's never going to be another version of you, ever, in the exact way that you are. Never going to happen. So if you don't believe in you, who's going to believe in you? Like, if you don't believe you're the shit, who's going to believe you're the shit? And it's only when I feel like I started to believe in myself and believe, like, yo... I think I'm fucking lit. That's when things really started to change for me. Um, invest in yourself, almost a similar thing, but it's like actually take money out your pocket and put it into your shit. Mm. Don't expect a miracle, like lose some peas before you gain some peas because you need to literally know what it feels like to sacrifice for your art. And boy, have I sacrificed for my art. Like, you know, you're going to have days where you lose a bag. You're going to have days where you make a bag. The idea is to have more days when you make a bag, but losing is a part of it. Don't be afraid to lose. Um, and I guess the final one is, yeah, just like find your path. Once you know where you're going, it's just the distance is time. From today to that destination is time. What you do in between determines like, how long that time is going to be. Mm. But if you know where you're going, you're going to get there. You will eventually get there. God willing, like, you will get there. Sure. That's it. Like, you, a lot of these self-help books that you read, Think and Grow Rich. I read Think and Grow Rich and I was like, duh, like, I knew this shit already. <laughs> like, Same. People don't know this shit. Like, Same. The whole concept of Think and Grow Rich is... <laughs> They say it's a secret at the beginning of the book, so spoiler alert, if you're currently <laughs> reading it, it's not a fucking secret. It's believe in your shit, like literally believe in your shit. That is it. If you can perceive it, if you can actually visualize it, you're going to get there. But if you wake up every day blasé, and this is what scared me in the pandemic, because I, I woke up and I was just like, fuck, like, where am I going? That's the most dangerous place to be. It's coasting. Just, coasting, you can't coast. You cannot coast. All of you out there that are in a job that you do not like, leave your fucking job. Go and do an apprenticeship. Sign up to, um, you know, like one of these uh, job companies that will appraise your skills mm. and help you figure out what you want to do. Go get some shitty jobs to figure out what you don't want to do. That's mm. also a part of the journey. Yeah. But, um, yeah, like you need to know where you're going. Like that is really important. And it's okay to also change where you want to go. That's something that, like, people are, like, I, back in the day, all I wanted to do was throw a festival. Fuck no, I don't want to do a festival no more. <laughs> no, that shit is stressful as hell. Yeah. Like, I've seen so many festivals go under and so much stress with this and that. Like, you can change what you want to do. I now have a whole new goal, and I'm so dedicated to it. Mm. Um, but, yeah, you need to know where you're going. You need to have, like, a completely deliberate decision on what you want to do with your life. I couldn't have said it, said it better, <laughs> honestly. And I second everything that you've just said because 
Yeah, and especially to that last point, cha- being able to allow yourself to adapt and change the change the course mm. is fine. Doesn't mean you've failed, it just means that you've learned something that you want to do, that you don't want to do, that, you, that you're unsure about, like you've learned in that change as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people are scared to change, so. A lot of people are scared to be vulnerable. Yeah. Especially men. You know, we have this toxic masculine trait of being vulnerable is like, especially like outwardly vulnerable for people to see. Why would you say this just as we're about to end this podcast? <laughs> to be what the heck? Bow. <laughs> but exactly that. Yeah. Um, you've just given me a brilliant idea, to be fair. So, and I'm going to say it out. We are going to do a round table. I want to do a round table with um, a few people that I've had on the podcast already. Um, one round table with just women, one round table with just men. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and me. Of course. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> I'm not a man. But I want to speak about mental health yeah. between men and between women. Mm-hmm. And um, I want to invite you back to that because that ending will be continued at yeah, that round table. Yeah. I've got a lot to say about that. Thank so, you yeah. so much for coming down. I appreciate you massively. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you for being so open and honest. Um, and listen, if you like a good party, you want to find DJ c I mean, honestly. Back with the body profit. I told you guys I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd, man. But yeah, um, man. But yeah massive thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You was just listening to the Promising Preneur podcast. I am Aliyah Amarat, and thank you so much for listening all the way through. Don't forget to click subscribe and share to at least one person, because that's the only thing that's going to fuel us to carry on.